more important than where Hunza is located is the story of this peaceful and isolated land and its happy and extremely interesting people. Almost 2,000 years ago, a few of the soldiers of Alexander the Great, tired of war, escaped with their Persian wives to this remote mountain stronghold. Today, their descendants enjoy a life and a culture unlike that of any other people in the world. Theirs is a state where disease and crime is virtually unknown. It is a community without hospitals or jails, without stores or restaurants, a place where money is seldom used. The route to Hunza presents many dangers and hardships. Only a few travelers have ever visited the isolated state, and those who do must obtain permits, which are issued only at the request of the mir or ruler of Hunza. The plane which flies the final 375 miles from Raul Pindi to Gilead is more suited for transporting of freight than passengers. So hazardous is this route through the mountain passes that only when weather conditions are ideal will the plane depart. must continue to its destination. The mountain valleys through which it must fly are so narrow that to circle and return would be impossible. Mountain ranges rising from 20 to 25,000 feet exceed the ceiling of the heavily loaded DC-3. And only pilots skilled in flying these mountain passes dare attempt this dangerous trip. After landing at Gilkitz, our camera party must clear their travel permits with the local officials and transfer luggage and equipment to jeeps for the final 68 miles to the capital of Honza, Balti. For centuries, the rough trail to be followed by these overloaded jeeps echoed only to the footsteps of the men and animals of the caravans that carried trading goods from China, Tibet, Mongolia, and Russia to barter with merchants and traders of Kashmir and northern India. For the caravans of the past, the dangers of the road were multiplied by the warlike Kunzakars, who levied tribute on all who entered their kingdom, occasionally killing the members of the caravan and taking their goods and animals. Only in recent times have these practices been abolished. But the natural hazards of this serpentine road are as real today as they were hundreds of years ago. The perils of the route to Baltique include frequent rock slides and avalanches that cascade down the mountainside, carrying huge boulders and debris to the river below. Many hours are spent in rebuilding sections of the road that have collapsed and plunged downward, using only their hands, rock, and dirt. The drivers and assistants rebuild an 80-foot section of the road. Only men of great vigor and strength would accomplish such a feat at this altitude and in the hot sun. Once past the roadblocks, miles of tortuous roads remain ahead. Suddenly, the trail ends at a cliff where a small cable car is hanging over a raging torrent of icy water 300 feet below. There is no choice but to go home, as it would be impossible to turn around. The aerial tram across the chasm is propelled only by the muscle power of several old men from a nearby village, a lesson in endurance and physical health. safely, the jeeps were reloaded, and the party sped over a dusty path to Balti. Approaching the capital, the jeeps passed the carefully terraced fields and irrigation ditches. From these plots of land come the crops 
that support more than 40,000 Honda trucks living in this mountain sheltered valley and its several villages. Over the centuries, the Hunter Cuts have created farmlands by terracing the lower slopes of the hillsides that border the valley. Rich river silt has been carried in baskets and placed behind stone barriers to create new paddies where a variety of crops are grown. These man-made fields yield a rich harvest of grain including wheat, barley, and buckwheat, which provide the enriched flowers used for bread and other basic foods. Ground crops include tomatoes, cabbage, peas, beans, potatoes, peanuts, and other familiar vegetables. Isolation and altitude tend to protect the crops from parasites and diseases, common to plant life in most areas of the world. Vegetables and fruits thrive in the warm summer sun, and their perfection of size and flavor is believed to be due largely to the high mineral content of the milky waters that flow from the glaciers of the Himalayas, through the mountain streams, and into ditches that irrigate the fields and orchards. Peaches, apples, cherries are grown in abundance. Grapes are dark and produce a fine domestic wine. Some of the wine is fermented into a vinegar used for cooking and also to season fresh vegetables. Most important of all fruit is the apricot. Not only is it enjoyed when fresh or dried, but from the kernel of the apricot, and oil is extracted, becomes an important element in the diet of the Hunza cuts. Apricot oil is rich in organic copper and vitamins, and serves as an excellent substitute for natural animal cooking fats. It is also used as a cosmetic by the women. And the process of extracting oil from the apricot kernel engages the energy of men, women, and children. The seed of the apricot is split open and its contents crushed in an ancient stone mortar. This mash is placed in an earthen dish, slowly heated, and then allowed to cool. This permits the oil to come to the surface. A simple label is used to empty the oil into a container for future use. Because of the scarcity of pasture land, animals are limited and considered a luxury. A few cows and goats provide a limited supply of milk that is, for the most part, converted into buttermilk, yogurt, and cheese. Animals also provide a source of power. Under the hooves of these animals, the grain from the villagers' plots of land is separated from the sheep. Water, diverted from a stream, is directed to a stone mill where the grain will be ground into flour. The miller grinds each family's grain and for his efforts is provided the food and other necessities that are needed to support his family. Himalayan sheep bear heavy coats of wool and, like the miller, this man works for the community weaving into cloth all of the wool produced in his village. For his services, he receives his fair share of the products that come from the fields of his neighbors. Much of the flour ground by the miller is mixed with ground beans or chickpeas to make a thin dough that, when baked, produces a native unleavened bread called chipatis. In many ways, it resembles, in preparation and final appearance, the tortillas of Mexico. This 90-year-old woman has made chipotles for more than 70 years. The typical Hunza home is two stories high and built of stone. At these elevations of 9 to 12,000 feet, the winters are long and severe, but usually bright and clear. The houses are comfortably heated by a small fire 
that burns in the center of the home on the ground level. A hole in the ceiling and one in the roof permits the warmth to move upward and the smoke to escape. These are simple dwellings, but also family temples, where at the beginning and close of each day, the members of the household repeat their Muslim prayers. While a few individuals perform specialized tasks, most Hunzikuts spend much of their time tending their fields, harvesting crops, or controlling the flow of water into the fields. Hunza has no juvenile delinquency. Its young people have many daily tasks to perform, but find time to enjoy swimming and other sports. These young women are panning for gold in the sandy gravel that lies beneath the fast-moving waters of a mountain stream. The gold that they find will be saved until enough has been collected to make a beautiful piece of jewelry. They have sent a military marching exercises. These activities are interspersed with a Recently, education was provided only for both. But today, Scoop Jamo Khan, the leader and final legal authority over all of the people of Hunza. For 600 years, members of his family have ruled this region. In 1947, Hunza joined Pakistan as an independent state, but the Mir retained his title and authority over his people. Guided by the teachings of the Quran, and the reforms introduced by his grandfather, the Mir Nizim Khan, the present Mir, Jamo Khan, serves as both the civil and spiritual leader of his people. Mir maintains daily contact with each village, and very little occurs in Hutta escapes his attention. Every day, the elders of the villages travel to Baltik to attend the Mir's colony. And every day they climb the steep path of the ancient castle that stands 1,200 feet up the mountainside. Here they report the happenings of the villages and discuss problems to be solved. Because there are no taxes, no crimes, and no serious domestic difficulties in Hunza, most of the problems concern water rights. Each individual presents his arguments and the council by vote makes a decision. Although the mayor usually supports the council point of view, he has, as absolute ruler, the right to veto or reverse their decision. Sports are a particularly important part of life in Hunza. Men of all ages, many who are 80 years or older, find enjoyment and helpful exercise in a strenuous game of volleyball. The Hunsikuts are not aware of age, and even the altitude and hot sun fail to discourage these older men from taking part in this hotly contested game. Except on rare occasions such as this, Marriage ceremonies are performed in December following the harvest season. The couples to be married participate in a mass wedding, which is attended by the Mir, the Lani, and most of the villagers. All who attend, but especially the brides and grooms, are dressed in their finest attire. Dancing and singing, followed by the traditional saber dance, is an important part of the ceremony. Like other public events, the activities are reserved for men. The women are only observers, watching the events from the protection of balconies surrounding the square. This isolation of women and girls is a Muslim tradition, related closely to the long-established and only recently abolished practice of Purdue. Unlike our customs, most marriages are planned by the families of the couple. Such arrangements may cover the dowry of the bride, plans for the honeymoon, which includes the groom's mother, and other family decisions. Since nothing is left to chance, most Hunza marriages are permanent, divorces virtually unknown. The men of Hunza are fine horsemen, 
and enjoy a variety of sports related to riding. Most daring and dangerous is the ancient game of polo, named after Marco Polo. The game, as now played in Hunza, was observed there by him in 1269, when his journey to Cafe carried him into the Hunza Valley. So intense is the competitive spirit of these players that nothing stops the game, even serious injuries, until the final goal is scored and the game ends. Few are the rules, and violence the engine. Wounds heal quickly, however, in this healthy land, and even broken bones mend firmly once they are reset. Every day begins for the Hunza Cuts with prayer. The Mir, a spiritual leader of his people, who are his Malian Muslims, goes each morning to the tomb of his grandfather. Here he reads his Quran and thinks deeply about its teachings. The word from his holy book gained new meanings as he looks out upon the peaceful and the towering mountains that rim the valley. From the mountains come the waters that give life to him, the inspiration and that leads to peace of mind and contentment. The Hunza cuts are from 